Mihevik. Hello, yes. Hello, Sergei. Very nice to see you here. Yes. Quite a while ago. So for Sergei, uh, here the, the lectures start at 11.07 sharp. <laughs> this is a view of Gelfand Zettlin, which is new. So uh, let me start in, uh, I wanted to uh, do this lecture about the gelfand settlin representation. So uh, Sergei Gelfand, who uh, is the son of uh, Isai Mosevich, uh, is here. And uh, um, I have been quite influenced by, uh, by Israel Mosevich Gelfand. His first trip abroad, uh, long trip abroad, was in Romania. That was uh, very far uh, in a foreign country, for us, I suppose. And uh, he stayed, I had just finished school, and, uh, and he uh, stayed at our institute. And uh, um, Bob McPherson came uh, from the United States for that occasion to our institute too. So it was a, it was a very intense uh, uh, session. So here is the paper. Uh, there are three pages. This is uh, uh, three and a half in translation of a paper which had no references. And uh, it had no references and uh, no, uh, uh, just a bit, so let me uh, see how I could get this a little bit better. So it had no references and no hint of a proof, but it was, uh, it was uh, uh, giving the first detailed, by that I mean represent using vectors, the first detailed representation of uh, SLN. These are the three pages and a half here. Uh, it was, uh, the formula was clearly a uh, generalization of the well-known SL2 representation. Uh, it had been checked for SL3. There is a slight uh, error in the science, actually, the, uh, fortunately, no signs whatsoever are needed, so all this sign inside is, is spurious, but it appears at SL4. So SL4 was beyond the computation at that time. The formula are extremely precise and uh, used today, and uh, it's still the only, uh, the only uh, vector representation of, uh, of SLN, which is... Uh, uh, which uh, is around, 
there are some others which use some equivalent classes, SPECHT, which we may use in our course. So, um, as you can see, there's a, a tableau. So instead of this, I'm going to give now a very elementary approach to it, which has the advantage that it can be generalized It can be generalized to higher dimensions, which is the purpose of this course. Now, the Pennsylvania State University, where I spent a lot of time, uh, is originally farming, was originally a farming institution. So we'll start by planting some vegetables. Can you turn on the light? Yes. Sure. Thank you. We're going to take a, an equilateral triangle, subdivided, and use only these lines for the moment. And uh, we're going to start with a wire from here, which has, which is supposed to go and exit through the top. And we're going to have it like this. So this is, these are the levels from the top one, two, three, four. And we read this as yes, this as no. So here, this is a vector E2. This is a place where this bends. Ah. Uh, we shall take from here now. So you can see that this encodes exactly the space V is C to the 4 for SL4. So this is an equivalent view of the gelfand settlin picture. Uh, now we start from the middle with another color, and uh, we're going to take a wire which goes like this. And you can see that it bends to the right on one and four. So this should be E1 wedge E4. This is how we read it. And this here, you can recognize then as V wedge V. V to the power wedge two. This wire, it encodes, it has exactly two places where it goes toward the wall. And these are the, this is a basis EI wedge EJ. And similarly, of course, here, well, let's take now another one. And the third one. That's why we have colored chalk. A third one here, which should go like this. And this one is in uh, V to the wedge three. And you can uh, recognize here that the edges are there any questions, please? Yes. You can recognize that the edges here are yes in Hodge dual. Yes, so the edges which point to the right are in the Hodge dual. Yes? So this is a wire representation. This is here what you have 
is a product, remember that the tensor product means Cartesian product of bases. So if you have colored wires like these, each of them, uh, each of them would encode uh, something, so we have, would encode one of the fundamental representations of SL2, and we have here four of them. So this is a big tensor product, since we have Cartesian product of the bases, and uh, for the Gelfand setting representation, we should remember that Hermann Weil showed that in such a tensor product, there is a highest weight irreducible. So this is, again, this is V, v wedge one, tensor V wedge two, tensor again V, this is wedge, wedge two, the second, the blue copy, tensor V wedge three, and there is a highest weight representation, which is denoted by its young, uh, young diagram. I'm going to put it exactly as it appears there. This highest weight irreducible. And the amazing thing is that you get this highest weight irreducible simply by neglecting crossings that is that you consider two wires that go like this the same as two wires that go like that. You neglect color exactly. So this is the same as neglect color. Because that's what happens. You see here the yellow wire could go the other way and the wire the other way. Yes, we would get a different, uh, a different vector, but um, but uh, uh, we, we treat them all together. So what this means is that uh, we're going to have only multiplicities of edges. So which multiplicities are something like uh, three here, one here, two, one, two, one, 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 and one. And uh, now this neglection is the same as a projection onto the irreducible, the highest weight irreducible. And uh, the exact projection is quite uh, interesting to describe, and we'll show that this is exactly what uh, the higher mathematics is providing. So that is powerful if uh, the type of product. Yes. It's, not if it's, the it's the highest weight irreducible, exactly in which we, we just keep multiplicity. So if we just uh, know the yellow numbers, and uh, let me also mention here that multiplicities satisfy 
a uh, conservation law. Namely, if you have here A, B, and here C, C, D, then A plus B is equal to C plus D. They are, by the way, in the original uh, uh, gelfand settlin uh, picture, they are the defect of inequalities. So when you write that A is less than or equal to B, the difference B minus A is a defect. And we're concentrating here on the defect inequalities. Uh, because of this conservation, we can uh, treat them as vegetables. It means that they don't uh, stop, they just grow. So once again, the, the reading is you take a wire, and if on the level uh, one, two, three, four, on the level I, the wire goes to the right, it is an E, it is a vector, basis vector. If not, it is not, but it is a vector if you read it backwards, which is exactly the Hodge dual. Now, uh, So, for instance, if you want to, uh, to have your students make, uh, in physics, make a nice, uh, a nice uh, uh, T-shirt with the uh, electromagnetic tensor, then the electromagnetic tensor is a two-form, so it goes, uh, here is dx, dy, dz, and dt, and you can have something like this, which is, uh, as you see, it goes to the right. This is dx wedge dt. And here you're going to have the electric field dx. So now the action of the matrix units, this is supposed to be a representation of SLN, a differential representation. So we're going to, uh, to see how, what e, e i i plus 1 does. Well, what it does in general is it takes e i plus 1 and it maps it into e i and 0 for the rest. Yes? So it means that it takes some wire which has a bent on the level i plus 1, but no i, and it sends it into this. So it is the e i i plus 1 is going this way. These are the flippers in a pinball machine. And uh, E i plus 1 i goes backwards. Now, where? You see there's a whole forest there of uh, wires and uh, a whole mesh of wires. And uh, according to the differential formula, Leibniz's formula, d of x, y is dx times y, and so on, uh, it should act on each, in each place where it can act separately, and then add up the, the actions. So um, So the action would be the sum over all possible such places on the levels i and i plus 1. As you move from right to left. 
uh, the coefficients now. The coefficients of the action are the following. Uh, you, uh, you are moving one wire Let's say i i plus e i i plus one. So this is e i i plus one, and uh, you have all kinds of uh, other things around. On the levels i and i plus one. And uh, the recipe for finding the, uh, the coefficient is the following. This is the main part, maybe, of the paper. Um, this is maybe a new way to compute it. You add one half to each multiplicity. Does maybe somebody who worked in representation theory know the importance of one half for this? It's the, for one half for SL2. Hmm? It's a vial vector, exactly. So this one half, this is a vial vector. goes from zero additive to one multiplicative. The real line has addition and multiplication, and it has different units in, in them. And similarly, for a representation, there's an additive and a multiplicative unit. And the viral vector is the difference between the two. Now. Once you add this, then you, know, uh, then you do the following. You take this multiplicity, then you take this one, then you take, and so on. So, and you take this on, this on the other side, and you take this multiplicity, and so on, so these, Odd zigzags uh, after they've been enhanced. And so you take the product of above multiplicities, each averaged before. and after the move. I'm going to show you an example here. So if you have here, for instance, if, the, if you make this move, and if here the multiplicity is five, then you have five before move. And of course, after you do the move, since you move a wire, you're going to have here six. Yes? You add one half to each, and you average and the average is six, yes? So you will have six times with a square root. And there is also a denominator under the square root. Namely, you look at the nodes. You look at the nodes, <laughs> uh, 
Again, the multiplicity of the nodes. And the nodes before times the nodes after. For each node, these go into the numerator. So the wires go into, into nodes. And this is a formula. I'll try to explain briefly how this uh, formula works. And then so first, the formula is self-adjoint. Namely, uh, the coefficient for Eij, Ei i plus 1, from alpha to beta, these are vectors, is the same as coefficient for Ei plus 1 i. So let me make sure uh, to emphasize here, because this may not be clear at the first view, what we are producing here are the vectors of the representation. Yes? At the bottom, the bulbs that we buy ourselves for growing these vegetables are the representation. So we take one, the one copies of the uh, generating representations, single dot, double dot, and so on. And uh, then we grow out of them these, uh, these vegetables, which uh, each of them is a vector. And the, the matrix unit in the representation moves these vectors. And uh, I'd just like to show one idea here of uh, how and why this works. You see, um, so again, this, this observation, remember that we always average between the situation before or after, or multiply the situation before and after the move. So this ensures that the representation is, is uh, self-adjoint. Uh, and um, in order to see now that, that we have an uh, E, let's say, E to 3, well, first of all, one more observation. What are these big zigzags here? In the case of SL3, so in the case of SL2, the coefficients are just uh, given by, this, uh, by these two numbers, and they were well known. In the case of SL3, if we make a move here or here, then we shall have just one thing. So we, we have uh, exactly, we have very few. In this case, we have just one case, one edge that we are counting. In the other direction, we have one or three. So this is clearly a generalization of the SL2 case. Yes, where we count just this, uh, the immediate neighbors. It's a generalization to, to bigger neighbors. Yes, now as to, uh, for instance, uh, showing that E23 and uh, e, uh, E23 and let's say E21, the commutator is zero, as it should be in the representation. Yes, so uh, imagine two runners who go toward each other. And then no matter how, no matter, so the distance is initially, let's say, n, and then one of them takes a step ahead, and then the distance is n minus 1, and the other takes a step ahead, and the distance is n minus 2. So if you look at these three distances, they are the same, same 
no matter which moves first. They exactly n, n minus one, and n minus two. However, if they move one after the other, which is Then if this one moves, so let's say the initial distance is n. If this one moves first, then the initial distance is n plus one, the, the later distance is n plus one. And then the second moves, and this is n, and the coefficient here will be n plus one times another n plus one, computed with the formula that we have. While if the, if the second one moves first, we have here n minus one, and then n again. And computed with that formula, we get an n times n. So since these are under the square root, the difference here is exactly one. So this is a fact very well known to policeman that if the thief runs toward you, it doesn't matter who starts first, but if the thief runs away from you, then it's important to be the first one to start. So that gives a commutator, the structure of the commutator. And the structure of this commutator was known to Gelfand and Zetlin, and they put the EIJs, so the higher EIJs, are uh, built by commutators. So E13 is built as a commutator out of this by the usual formula. Uh, the formula for what happens at commuting EIJ with EJI is uh, very tricky. Uh, that's what the denominators are for. And uh, I don't think it's uh, fully understood even today. So it's, uh, I mean, one can prove it, of course, by an easy induction, or it follows just out of the representation itself by other means, but, but uh, it should still be understood. Now, Uh, yes, just a moment. Yes. This is a Lie algebra here. This is a Lie algebra, exactly. We just, we take the Lie algebra of GLN, as Gelfand and Zetlin put it, a differential representation. They didn't use the name Lie algebra, the differential representation of GLN. I mean, uh, the triangle is, uh, is some separation. Is that an entity, a uh, subunit? No, no, this is, uh, this is supposed to be uh, uh, graphical representation. No, these are just vectors in the representation. Yes, the nodes represent the generators of that representation. Now, the representation itself, so this is extremely elementary. You have the differential algebra GLN, yes, with uh, differential generators EIJ, uh, EII plus one, and you represent them on some vectors, and that's just, uh, those are all the vectors. Oh. The nodes at the bottom, you mean? Yeah. The nodes at the bottom define what representation we are in. Yes, yes, absolutely. Absolutely, yes, exactly. Exactly. 
And let me, uh, so let me continue fast so that we can go to the, uh, so uh, once you have uh, this construction, uh, there is a highest weight so you can push everything toward the wall, which is here, something like this. So this is the highest weight. And if you use all the EI, so you, you, you move everything up. So you use all the EI, I plus one. And um, the fact that this is an irreducible representation is obtained by pushing everything to the highest weight and then descending, so using lowering operators, to move from this highest way down. And so again, in the highest weight, every uh, vegetable grows toward the right wall, right hand side wall. So the lowering operators now, you see, if we want to move the vectors away from the wall, uh, what we would like to get is something like this, move one wire here. So the operator which moves one wire here from the position I on the position N, and we could uh, think about using E N I, which is good, except that E N I, if you look at the way it acts, it acts on rhombuses put anywhere around, not a single one. So it would have also all kinds of other effects. So you could move this one a little bit instead of here and so on. So the idea is to take this as a leading term and add instead E, for instance, uh, I'm not going to write uh, the formula in full. Let me give an example. So if you want to do E6, uh, 2, the operator is called Z, will be called Z62, and this is E62 plus others, and is obtained by a sum of partitions like the following E2, E, so you take the interval 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, you subdivide it into a few. Let's take, for instance, two, four, and six. So any subpartition, and uh, we take E42 times E64. And we also use some H, some diagonal operators, which we'll describe in a moment. And H for the H. Uh, this age is an age shifted. It's on the positions I, in this case, two and I. For I is, so this is a product of things, and for I are the missing things, which are three and five. H to five and H to uh, H to three and H to five, H shifted. I have not uh, mentioned yet uh, the action of the diagonal operators. So once again, this formula here, uh, the reference which you should read is Molev, uh, Molev from Sydney wrote uh, a great uh, paper of about uh, 20 pages for the Encyclopedia of Mathematics. So it's extremely explicit on this, but of course the, the images are very different or the, uh, the setup. But uh, 
Uh, here's how the H operator acts. H counts the number of... So uh, we're going to... So the operator HIJ is EII minus EJJ, and it, uh, it acts... Uh, so we have weights here. The weight... I is obtained in the following way. It's a number of wires that cross this way minus the number of wires which cross this way on the level I, I plus one. Yes? So this does not depend on how you label the wires. Uh, so... Uh, Yes, exactly. This is the Cartan Sub algebra. And this is the. Uh, so Hij is uh, then the weight I minus the weight J. And when it's shifted, it's shifted uh, to adjust for the number of wires, making each, each uh, multiplicity bigger by one half. Okay, so uh, now let's go to uh, the higher. Uh, the higher representation picture. And uh, for this, we're going to start with uh, two-dimensional pictures exactly like the one before. And... Uh, and put them on the, so I'm going to give here and start by an example of such a higher vector. We're going to have here uh, some representations of SL, of SL, uh, N here, SL4. We're going to have at the bottom an intertwiner of such representations. And this intertwiner will be exactly like the vectors, but uh, it will use blades of this, uh, it will use some uh, lines of this kind, which we're going to, I'm going to call them blades. They're called now, uh, a few physicists have used these blades, which I have introduced, and they're calling them oblates. So, uh, these are blades, and uh, I'm going to tell the, show them to you as curvature very soon. And here we can grow representations just like before. What we're going to, uh, to do, so at the bottom we're going to have some uh, intertwiner, and we're growing out of it two-dimensional leaves. So the vectors of the higher, higher gelfand settling representation start at the bottom. A typical configuration would be this one. And, uh, and then grow this throughout a pyramid. So this is mathematics uh, one higher than over SL3. And let me uh, give you an, uh, an example of uh, such a thing and the description of it. Now, in order to do the intertwiners, so intertwiners are linear map between representations between the tensor product of representations which respect the representation. And um, although these intertwiners can be quite complicated, in the, uh, in the case of SLN, these inter the structure of the intertwiners as uh, honeycombs 
uh, was uh, uh, was uh, done uh, by Berenstein and Zelewinski. The image that we are going to use is very different so for these blades and i'm going to show you also the way to obtain the weights the point is the following even in the gelfand settling picture we have the following uh, observation if you want to fold a sheet of paper so put some night some uh, some uh, Gaussian curvature at a point. You cannot have just two lines. It continues with one line, as you see it here, right? Or the same two can continue with a trough. So this one uh, in here, so this was a roof, and you can also make uh, a, a trough, excuse me, the other way. Oh, very good. The trough goes the other way. You open it up like this, you see, and you have a negative curvature coming through the middle, yes? Here you had a positive curvature coming the other way. Now, if you notice uh, right here where we define these, these would continue with a plus here, and this would continue with a minus, which is a curvature that I was showing. So the formula here, the number, of parentheses minus the other number of parentheses is exactly the expression of curvature if we let it come through the side. So the weights appear as curvature. Now, as to the intertwiners, the same happens. And let me show you a, uh, an image now. By the way, we shall use uh, in the course, uh, the, these are entirely implemented, the Gelfand Settling. This is how uh, a Gelfand Settling uh, picture looks like with wires, and the action is, is live. So you can, you can act with EIJs, uh, and uh, it, would give you, uh, it would give you exactly these pictures. Let me go now, let me show you now the, uh, uh, the idea of curvature, so uh, This is a, a triangulated surface, exactly the surface for our intertwiners. And uh, we, cur we bend it randomly by giving it some height. And then we start to lift it. And what you notice now is exactly, on the one hand, we had multiplicities if we didn't lift. We had multiplicities for the edges. These multiplicities for the edges are a bend here. So you can see them after we bend as the width of these blue segments. 
the multiplicity of the vegetable roots on the sides are exactly this bend. So if you take a wire and you bend it, the bends at each node encode exactly a Young diagram. So now in 3D, as you can see, the, the honeycombs, and this is a picture on the post of the representation, appear exactly as curvature with Gaussian indicators. Ah, the, that, that is encoding exactly the intertwiner. So the, uh, the, the theorem is that there are exactly as many intertwiners as there are integer ways to bend the middle in a convex way, given the boundary. So you're given the boundary and you're bending the middle. Yes? There are, however, I mean, the advantage of this point of view over the traditional one for the Gelfand settling is the following. Uh, uh, you see, when I, I started by looking at the Gelfand settling as a way to go toward higher representations. So uh, that was clearly the fundamental, uh, the fundamental picture. And we're going to, uh, uh, I'm going to show you how this generalizes now to higher, to the higher case as well. So, so this is a higher intertwiner. You have a simplex now, which is exactly here, the root, a piece of the root lattice of SL4. And you are, uh, you are looking at it now from the side, which is like this. We are in four dimensions. We bend it again randomly, which again would encode an intertwiner. We lift it. And then we rotate again in 3D. And we obtain a higher dimensional picture of the same intertwiners and if we neglect the height of the representation. So this is a higher gelfand settling representation. It grows from a usual intertwiner and it, uh, it continues in a simplex for, SL, uh, for SL4, um, for the SLNs, but the whole thing can be uh, given sense uh, way beyond that for exceptionals and uh, so on. What I would like to show you here is that uh, in addition to having a, uh, uh, in the higher case, to having a, uh, um, let me try to find here a higher matrix. So in addition to, to finding a, uh, a higher, um, oh, here it is, the 2D matrix. open with Mathematica, of course. So this is how a, a higher matrix would look like, the matrices which, which act on, uh, on the higher Gelfand uh, settling picture. So this is a matrix. It looks like a tensor, actually. It, if you notice, it's a 4 by 4 over 4 by 4, exactly like the general relativity tensor. But if we look carefully at it, its diagonal is really an SL3. Uh, it's an SL3 uh, um, lattice, root lattice. So this is uh, the matrix and this is the SL3 lattice. The whole higher structure is encoded into its involution, which generalizes the, uh, the involution of uh, the usual transpose for a matrix. So instead of having a transpose for a matrix, you have the vial group S3. 
of SL3 in the higher case acting. And uh, maybe the last thing that I'd like to mention is how this generalizes the self-adjointness. This is uh, maybe the most important part of, uh, of uh, what we are talking about. So as you can see here, this is uh, the highest weight makes perfect sense. The highest weight is here in red. It starts from the bottom and it goes toward the wall. Yes. And then there are moves. The moves here are tunnels. As you see, instead of a Gelfand settling flipper from one pair of edges to the other, there's a full tunnel going on. Yes. And in the self adjoint case, Sruthi, maybe I'll, uh, I'll borrow your uh, pad. So you see, in the self adjoint case, you make a move from, left, from right to left here with an E21, and the person on the other side sees it as E12. Yes, that's exactly what I was saying. Now, you can imagine how this generalizes to a pyramid. If you make a, uh, uh, you have now not two observers, but three. And the matrices, the higher matrices act in such a way that uh, if you permute the three observers according to the high involution, they will see exactly the same thing as if you apply the involution to the matrix. And that higher involution, like a higher form of Fourier transform, encodes everything. So, so this makes a very, uh, a very uh, concise way to axiomatize, uh, to ax axiomatize it all. Yes, so uh, uh, one, uh, maybe one last uh, remark I would like to make. Namely, I would like to show here one, uh, one very simple thing, which I don't think uh, has been uh, satisfactorily showed before at all. Namely, I was uh, telling you uh, I was telling you how uh, neglecting the wire crossings, how neglecting the wire crossings uh, gives you the irreducible components. Now, here, if you have here an action of SL2, which goes with wires like this, on this face. And you have in the back a similar action of SL2, which goes also with wires like that. Now, if you want to tensor the two, so this is the base here, you want to tensor the two, you can either uh, tensor them like this, they cancel each other, yes? So this is sigma spin one half times spin one half contains a trivial, or both of them go to the front, and this should give you the adjoint representation of SL2. Yes, and if both of them go to the front, you can see exactly how this is done. They can either use two triangles here, one triangle and the other triangle, to send you in the front E1 tends E1 star, or they can use two squares, which would go like this. So one square goes from here to, uh, let's see. So they go from the back like this, one and two. You can see a square here, so this is uh, a big square. And this would give you minus E2 tensor E2 star. And this is exactly the element H12. So the tensor product of the two representation maps into, so maps into the front representation through the pyramid. Uh, this is a higher part of the representation and it explains exactly how and why the Gelfand setting representation projects onto the highest weight. 
So I'd like to stop here. Uh, you're welcome to come and see, uh, take a look at uh, uh, this uh, picture here. As you see, we have here an intertwiner, and it grows through the highest weight representation, red into the wall. As you can see, it grows this way. And it also, after that, I have applied the lowering operator to show uh, which uh, gives you the blue part. Yes, we have to go.